Good evening and um, welcome to PNP Live. I'm Brad Graham, the co-owner of Politics and Prose, along with my wife, Lisa Muscatine. And we have a, a very timely and very informative program for you this evening, featuring Washington Post investigative journalist, Craig Whitlock, talking with another investigative reporter, James uh, Laporta uh, from the Associated Press about Craig's new book, The Afghanistan Papers, A Secret History of the War. A couple of brief housekeeping notes first though, uh, to post a question at any point uh, during the event, just click on the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. Uh, and in the chat column, you'll find a link for purchasing copies of the Afghanistan Papers. Also there is a link to a nonprofit organization, HIAS, based uh, near here in Silver Spring, Maryland, that is assisting Afghan refugees. Craig joined the Washington Post more than two de decades ago after stints at a couple of newspapers in the South. At the Post, he went from covering local and state stories to serving as a foreign correspondent, Pentagon reporter, and national security specialist. A few years ago, he received a tip that a little known federal agency, the Office of the Special Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconstruction, compiled some very revealing transcripts and notes of interviews with hundreds of people who played direct roles in the Afghanistan war. The interviews, it turned out, contained a lot of criticisms and finger pointing by officials who hadn't shared their honest views with the public. In fact, their concerns about the war over the years contrasted with the much rosier picture that had been painted by successive American administrations. It took some uh, persistent uh, efforts, including a couple of lawsuits, before Craig and, and the Post were able to obtain the documents, which then, taken together with hundreds of previously classified memos about the war from Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld that also emerged, led to a blockbuster series uh, in the Post in late 2019. But Craig didn't stop there. He found his way to hundreds of additional interviews that had been conducted by the Army with Afghanistan veterans, mostly junior officers. And at the University of Virginia's Miller Center, Craig found another cache of revelatory oral histories with senior Bush administration members. These all form the basis of the Afghanistan papers. The book provides a searing account of America's mistakes, mismanagement, and missed opportunities in what became America's longest war. And it exposes what senior military and civilian authorities actually realized about the futility and strategic drift of that effort. Now, uh, uh, Jim Laporta, uh, who will be talking with Craig, uh, served in the Marine Corps and, and deployed uh, a, a number of times to Afghanistan before becoming a journalist. At the Associated Press, his reporting has centered on military intelligence and national security issues. Uh, so Craig and Jim, the screen is yours. Thank you for having me. Uh, Craig, let's build a house, okay? And, and I want you to sort of set the foundation. What are the Afghanistan papers? What is cigar? And why are they important? Yeah, so I think Brad did a pretty good job of outlining it. The, Af the core of the Afghanistan papers are a collection of, of interviews with more than 400 uh, people who played a, a key role in the war, from generals and diplomats and White House officials to aid workers and Afghans and, and soldiers on the front line. Uh, these interviews were conducted with people who had served there uh, primarily under the Bush and Obama administrations. And the whole purpose of them was for a project called Lessons Learned, so that the government could could figure out what went wrong in Afghanistan and sort of come up with recommendations for avoiding a repeat of this in the future. Uh, the inspector general or SIGAR, as you said, uh, you know, they were going to publish a series of public reports on this lessons learned project. And they, they started to in 2016, but uh, you know, the reports were fine, but they omitted all the harsh criticism in these interviews and only named a very few of the people who, who had talked to. So uh, when the Post was able to finally, after multiple federal lawsuits under the Freedom Information Act, obtain the documents, uh, we were able to post them in their entirety online and people could see for themselves a lot of the withering criticism and frankly, uh, confessions from people in charge of the war about uh, 
how they didn't know what they were doing, how they, they didn't have an effective strategy, and uh, how, above all, the public messaging about how the war was making progress was it completely uh, contradictory to what was really going on on the ground. And just so we're clear, the, the documents that uh, the Washington Post obtained through several lawsuits, is, is my understanding, those documents expand what time frame of the Afghan war? Just, and just so we're clear on that. Well, most all of it from the beginning in 2001. So this is with people who served there any point between 2001 and 2017. So really uh, the Bush and Obama administrations with a little bit of overlap with the start of the Trump years. Okay. Uh, I wanna ask you about what's transpired in Afghanistan the last two weeks and, and how it sort of pertains to what your book lays out. Um, there is, uh, there's this quote from Lieutenant General Michael Flynn uh, that uh, I'm struck by. Um, and I feel like there's a little bit of two camps that are happening right now, given the events that have transpired in Afghanistan over the past couple of weeks. Um, he says in his interview uh, that was in 2015, he says, quote, if we're doing such a great job, why does it feel like we're losing? Uh, how it, and I wanted to ask you about that quote in the context of right now. There seems to be two camps right now. Um, the, um, there are people, one camp is, we have accomplished our goals in Afghanistan. We've achieved our objectives. Our objectives were to go into Afghanistan and uh, dismantle Al Qaeda, to uh, find and kill bin Laden. And we've met those goals. So that's one camp. And, and we'll be able to um, continue our presence there. And, and if there is a future attack, we'll be able to protect ourselves with over the horizon capabilities. That is to say, airstrikes um, uh, from, you know, launched from, you know, a different uh, location. There's this other camp that feels that our withdrawal has put us in more danger. Now that the Taliban have um, taken over that anything that we did accomplish over the past 20 years has been for nothing, that those object objectives will now be eroded. And now not only do we have to worry about the Taliban, uh, we do have a, a, an ISIS affiliate in, in Afghanistan. And I'm wondering if your book, uh, does your book speak to this current narrative that's happening in Washington right now in terms of, you, you know, wh which one is it? Are, do we accomplish our goals? Are we safer today than we were 2001? Or, you know, where are we? Well, I, I think there's a third camp, Jim. I think the third camp would say uh, we should have pulled out a long time ago uh, that we, you know, we haven't accomplished much for the last 10 years since bin Laden was was killed in Pakistan. Uh, that you know, what we have to show for the last 10 years is is not much of anything. And this gets back to the original purpose of the war. People remember back in 2001 uh, when we went to war in Afghanistan. The whole point, uh, the whole stated objective was to retaliate for the September 11th attacks to destroy Al Qaeda so that it couldn't carry out a repeat of what happened on September 11th. You know, this was seen as a just war, a war of self-defense, and that's how it was sold to the American people. And, and most people supported it by the spring of 2002, uh, when the Taliban had been removed from power uh, and Al Qaeda's leaders had more or less all been captured, killed, or fled Afghanistan. Uh, Bush's approval ratings were sky high. They were almost 90% at one point. Uh, but that was the original mission. The original objective was to go after Al Qaeda. That was it. And ever since 2002, there's been mission creep that set in that, uh, you know, there hasn't been a consensus on exactly what we were trying to achieve in Afghanistan. You know, Al Qaeda was gone for the most part, but, you know, we, we had, we stuck around because Afghanistan was in such terrible shape economically. There were millions of refugees. There was fears of a real famine. So, you know, understandably, the Bush administration felt an obligation to try and stabilize the country. But how it did that or how it tried to do that over the ensuing years, that's where things went off the rails. And, you know, both Obama and Trump tried to right the ship, but neither of them was successful. But what all those presidents had in common was after the original objective was met in terms of uh, degrading the threat from Al Qaeda, you know, there, there wasn't any consensus on what were the benchmarks, what were we really trying to accomplish, and, and how do you measure it? How do you know when it was time to get out? They were all trying to build up this Afghan government, but was the point to 
you know, bring democracy to Afghanistan? Was it to ensure uh, human rights and the rights of women and children? You know, was it because we were trying to stabilize a region or we were worried about nuclear arms in Pakistan? You know, there, there, it was never really clear what we were still doing there and how long we needed to stay. And that's been the question that's really dogged the war since 2002. Can you talk about that? I was going to ask this question later on, but uh, uh, since you brought it up, can you talk about that in terms of what exactly is, what do we say? Mission creep is a very sort of uh, Defense Department, a Pentagon phrase, uh, mission creep. But can you talk about that in the context of, you, you know, one of the things that, that people can will take away from your book, I think, is the fact that you keep having these generals, American generals and even British generals coming into Afghanistan and rotating out of Afghanistan, but they all come out, as soon as they get there, the two things that they, they all sort of say is, nobody can seem to define what winning is. No one seems to be able to define what winning is. And the fact that uh, there, are, there tends to be a lot of tactics, but there doesn't seem to be a coherent strategy. So can you talk about this, the idea of mission creep in, co in the context of this lack of strategy that continues year after year? Yeah, sure. So mission creep, I, I think most people kind of understand. It's when the goals and objectives start to get fuzzy and, and the, they start to expand. You know, the mission at first was limited to trying to eliminate Al Qaeda, but then then part of the mission became, well, we need to stand up a new Afghan government and we'd like to have elections and we want to uh, deliver humanitarian aid. And, and all of these things are, are noble and, and noteworthy. But there was never, again, it was never clearly articulated, how long do we need to do that? To what end? When will we know the job is done? You know, all of those things were never defined. And you talk about defining what the objectives are. There was a fascinating interview in the Afghanistan papers with uh, Lieutenant General Dan McNeil. He was the commander of US forces in Afghanistan twice during the Bush administration. And the second time he also oversaw NATO forces. And in his interview, he said very bluntly, he said, before I went over, I tried to get someone to define for me what winning meant and nobody could. So it's like, you know, his point was, how will we, how will we know when we've won? And nobody could explain that. And he added, you know, some people were talking about, uh, you know, bringing Jeffersonian democracy to Afghanistan, but, but that's never gonna happen, he said. And so he was frustrated, but the point was, that's mission creep. We, what were the objectives? How will we know when we've won and we can come home? And nobody ever defined that. There was another interview with the former U.S. ambassador to NATO, Nicholas Burns. Uh, you know, he's a career diplomat, and he was he was our NATO representative during the Bush years. And he said, by 2003, 2004, 2005, he said, you know, we lost track of what was going on over there. He said, I could never, I can't recall ever having a conversation with other senior Bush administration officials about how long we would need to be in Afghanistan or what we needed to do before we could leave. And you know, this is a remarkable thing. So you have this top diplomat, the commanding general, both admitting that they didn't, you know, what was the mission? What was the purpose? How long would they have to stay? How will we know when we've won? And you know, that's pretty striking. That shows that from the early years, again, uh, the, the goal of this war was, was really going off the rails. Nobody could define it. Well, it's interesting that the, the diplomat said that in the years that he listed. I mean, the years that he listed, 2003, 2004, 2005, we're shifting away from Afghanistan. Focus becomes on Iraq. And so does that exacer exacerbate the problem in Afghanistan in terms of this lack of strategy where the national focus shifted from Afghanistan, you know, right after the Taliban has toppled? And, and, and at one point, you, you say that at one point, um, uh, I'll bring it up. There was a, there was a gentleman uh, by the name of um, Todd Greentree, who he said, one of the, uh, and I'm quoting here, he says, one of the unfortunate errors that took place after 9-11 was in our eagerness to get revenge, we violated, we violated the Afghan war, uh, the Afghan way of war. That is when one side wins, the other side puts down their arms and reconciles with uh, the other side. And I'm wondering, you know, the, the years that you're listing were shifting away from Afghanistan, you know, but I'm wondering, what does he mean there by we violated the Afghan way of war? So there's a, there's a lot of to unpack there, but what Ty yeah. Greentree was talking about, he was a diplomat in Afghanistan, served multiple tours. He was saying that the, the history and culture of Afghanistan, this is a country that 
had been invaded many, many times over the years. They had civil wars. They had many factions, but, you know, so they were used to fighting, but uh, usually after conflict, people switch sides. They change their allegiances. And when one side is defeated, uh, they're not necessarily vanquished, you know, that they're, they're constantly shifting coalitions and swearing fealty to whoever has won. And so his point was, after 2001 and early 2002, when it looked, when the Taliban had been removed from power, the Bush administration lumped the Taliban into the same basket with Al Qaeda. It said they were all terrorists. They were all bad guys. And Rumsfeld and Bush said, we don't negotiate with terrorists. We're not going to let the Taliban into the new political system in Afghanistan. You know, the, the new Afghan government consisted of our allies during the war, mostly warlords from the Northern Alliance. But uh, the Taliban were shut out. They had been defeated. And Rumsfeld in particular said, you know, there's, you know, the Taliban has two choices. They can surrender or they can die. So there was, you know, at the time, this seemed understandable, right? You know, Americans were very angry about what happened on September 11th. We weren't looking to forgive a, a, a group in Afghanistan that had uh, hosted Al Qaeda in their country. So, you know, there wasn't a big push to try and bring the Taliban into the new political system in Afghanistan. But in retrospect, that was a huge mistake. And from the Obama, from the Obama years on, we sort of half-heartedly tried to reach out to the Taliban and because we realized that there needed to be some kind of political reconciliation among all the factions in Afghanistan for the war to end. But we, we missed that opportunity early on. Afghanistan has always sort of like ebbed and flowed in terms of uh, Americans sort of paying attention to it. And I don't think that's a, um, I don't think that's a, an egregious thing to say. Uh, you know, it's, it's gotten news coverage and then it's fallen out of the news coverage and the news cycle and then it's come back again. And, but Afghanistan has been sort of the leading coverage, you know, over the past couple of weeks um, and rightfully so. And I'm wondering, you know, obviously your book was written before, you know, uh, the American public saw Afghans falling from C-17s and people hammering to try to get out of uh, Harman Karzai International Airport. But I'm wondering, is there an interview amongst your documents that sort of predicted what we're seeing? That sort of was a, you know, that uh, they almost saw what was coming, coming? Well, most of them, in some ways, they're all very pessimistic. Uh, and they're focused mm -hmm. on different subjects, whether it's building the Afghan army or corruption in the Afghan government or the future of the country or, or the strength of the Taliban. So they're all very pessimistic. Not, almost none of these interviews, I don't, can't think of a single one where somebody said, yeah, this is all gonna work out uh, or we're gonna win in the end, or, you know, yeah, there have been a lot of bumps in the road, but you know, th this is gonna look good in the end. Nobody was saying that. Everybody was predicting, if, if they were asked to predict that things might not turn out well. Um, but you, you mentioned about Americans, you know, ebbing and flowing with their attention, you know, that's. I think that's certainly understandable. The conflict's dragged on for 20 years. It's the longest war in American history. Uh, people are going to tune it out. But you know, there was also a deliberate effort by different administrations to uh, tell the American people that everything was good over there and that they should they didn't need to pay attention anymore. Uh, this started early on in May of 2003. People remember when President Bush went on the aircraft carrier and gave his mission accomplished speech about the war in Iraq. You know, he, he claimed mission accomplished in Iraq just six weeks after that war had started. And of course, you know, this came back to haunt him because Iraq was just trying to unravel at that point. But I think people forget on that very same day, Donald Rumsfeld went to Kabul and appeared with uh, Afghan President Hamid Karzai. And Rumsfeld said the same thing about Afghanistan. He said, major combat operations in Afghanistan are over. So he was trying to tell the American people, essentially the war was over and we were just in this peacekeeping phase almost. But he knew that wasn't true. And in interviews we obtained for the Afghanistan papers there were army officers serving at military headquarters in Kabul who said they were shocked by Rumsfeld's speech. They said, you know, we never got any order to stop combat operations. They were still ongoing and they would tick off the names of, you know, operation, you know, mountain this and mountain that and what they were chasing the Taliban and near the Pakistani border. So, 
you know, here's Rumsfeld deliberately not telling the truth because he's trying to make Americans think both wars are in hand and things are over and people didn't need to be concerned anymore. But you see this pattern repeat itself under Obama too. In December of 2014, he declared an end to the combat mission in Afghanistan. This was seven years ago. And he said, the, the war in Afghanistan is drawing to a responsible conclusion. So he's sending this message the war is all but over. Uh, but of course, that wasn't true either. We still engage in combat for years to come. Scores of Americans died in combat and, and thousands of Afghans did. So there's this deliberate attempt by different presidents and their administrations to you know, reassure Americans that the war is in hand when it really wasn't. So no wonder people wouldn't pay attention anymore. You know, you brought up Rumsfeld and and you know, I, I wanted to, I was sort of struck by something you said in your, your foreword. You said uh, two weeks after the 9-11 attacks, um, Donald Rumsfeld was at the podium in the Pentagon room. And he paraphrased a quote from British Prime Minister Winston Churchill. And he says, quote, in wartime, truth is so precious that she should always be attended by a bodyguard of lies. And then later on, he gets asked by, you know, uh, a reporter, you know, whether or not um, he, he's justifying, you know, spreading lies during wartime. And, and he says, quote, the answer to your question is no, I cannot imagine a situation. I don't recall that I've ever lied to the press. I don't intend to. And it seems to me that there will not be reason for it. He says there are dozens of ways to avoid having to put yourself in a position where you're lying. And I don't do it. And, and what I want to ask you is, it, it's a very simple question. Is were they lying? Well, I think the they Bush were. The Bush administration and the Obama administration and onward, were they lying? They, they were, and I don't say that lightly. I, I sort of want to finish that anecdote you told about Rumsfeld in the briefing room. You know, he's yeah. saying, uh, I'm not going to lie. Of course not. I never do it. And then the follow up question was, does that go for everyone in the Department of Defense? And Rumsfeld paused and he gave this little smile and he says, You've got to be kidding, right? So, and everybody starts laughing, but it's this very weird answer. It's essentially saying, I'm not gonna lie, but you know, I can't say that for everybody at the Pentagon. And it's essentially saying, you can expect that people aren't gonna tell the truth. So he's, he's trying to have it both ways here. But yeah. uh, you know, clearly if you read the book, it's 350 pages of example after example of people not telling the truth. And that ranges from people giving optimistic spin, you know, the rosy happy talk that maybe they're deceiving themselves about how things are going in Afghanistan to things that are demonstrably untrue to things that people in particular knew what they were saying was false. I'll give you one example. This is later in the Bush administration in 2006 on the fifth anniversary of September 11th, the war commander at the time, General Carl Eikenberry gives an interview to ABC News and he's asked, how are things going in Afghanistan? And he says, we're winning in Afghanistan. Now, this was a, a, a real stretch because at that point, the Taliban had been making a comeback. The number of suicide bombings had quintupled over the previous year. There were roadside bombs or IEDs all over the place. It was clear the Taliban was making a comeback. Yet, Eikenberry says, we're winning, we're winning. The war's not over, but we're winning. Well, okay, whatever. He's maybe spinning things. What do you expect a general to say? But two weeks earlier, the U.S. ambassador to Afghanistan, who at that time was a guy named Ron Newman, he writes a classified diplomatic cable that he sends back to Washington. He copies it to the Pentagon, the State Department, the White House, and General Eikenberry's headquarters. And the first line of that cable says, we are not winning in Afghanistan. So here's the ambassador, his official private conclusion is we're not winning. And he goes on to warn about the Taliban making a comeback. Yet in public, his counterpart in charge of the, of the U.S. military in Afghanistan is, is you know, saying we're, we're, we are winning. So, you know, they're saying things they know are not true and that contradict the internal assessments of how the war is going. And this goes on year after year after year after year. And there's more examples than I can count in the book of this. I wanted to get your reaction to, to uh, a couple of quotes that came out right after you published um, your report in the Washington Post. And this is uh, December of 2019, I believe. Um, 
General Mark Milley, who is uh, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, um, you know, is at the Pentagon along with, uh, at the time, it was Defense Secretary Mark Esper. Um, and I wanted to get your reaction to something he said. He says, I know there, he says, quote, I know there's an assertion out there of some sort of coordination, li uh, coordinated lie over the last 18 years. He says, I find that that is a mischaracterization in my own personal experience. He says, you're looking at probably hundreds of general officers, State Department employees, CA, Department of Defense folks. I don't think you can get that level of coordination to do that kind of deception. And, and Esper follows up with, this has been very transparent. It's not like this war was hiding somewhere. Some type of insinuation that there's been this large scale conspiracy is just to me ridiculous. And I wonder what you thought about that. Well, look, they're, they're stumbling around trying to explain uh, something they, they can't really explain, right? So they say, oh, there wasn't a conspiracy. Well, I mean, conspiracy is kind of a loaded word, but the, the record is clear. The historical record is clear. They weren't telling the truth. They were exaggerating the good things and hiding the bad things. And Milley is a good example of this. He actually first went to Afghanistan in 2003 to try and help stand up an Afghan army. He later goes back as the deputy commander of U.S. troops and NATO troops in Afghanistan in 2013. And he stands up in public on numerous occasions at press conferences, briefings uh, before, at the Pentagon, and says the Afghan army is doing great. And I'm paraphrasing here, but he says the Afghan army is taking the fight to the Taliban. And reporters would always say, yeah, but what about this? What about that? It looks like the Taliban keeps gaining ground and the Afghans aren't doing very good. And they're abandoning their posts, they're deserting, you know, there's ghost soldiers, their commanders steal their salaries. You know, how can you say the Afghan army is doing great and they're supposed to be our ticket to get out of here? And Milley would push back, he'd say, the Afghan army and police force, you know, they're gonna win. We're talking about victory here. They're gonna, you know, beat the Taliban down. Well, you know, he knew at that point because there had been innumerable reports filtering up through the chain of command saying that the Afghan army and, and the police forces were not competent, that they were corrupt, that they weren't motivated, they couldn't shoot straight, uh, that in particular their commanders were incompetent and were, were being feather bedded in these jobs. So Milley knew all this and yet in public he's saying they're doing great, they're doing great, everything's going according to plan. So he has to live with what he said in the record over the years. And what's he going to say now that he admits that he, he wasn't telling the truth? You know, I'm not holding my breath that people are going to hold themselves accountable on this. But, I, you know, I will give you one example. Recently, Admiral Mike Mullen, who is a former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, he was asked very directly on ABC News. Uh, he helped oversee the surge of troops in, in no Afghanistan under Obama. And he's admitting, he said, look, we were wrong. We thought we could get this right and we were wrong. So at least he's being honest a little bit now about the shortcomings, but there's a lot of people at the Pentagon that publicly, I think, you know, they're gonna have a hard time coming to grips with what they said over the years. Yeah, I was, I was struck by Admiral Mullen's comments. Uh, I was a part of President Obama's surge. And so it was striking to hear his comments of like, he, I, I believe he said he, he regretted giving that advice to the president to surge troops into Afghanistan uh, in 2008, 2009. Um, you, a lot of people, uh, there's been a lot of comparison to the Afghanistan papers, to the Pentagon papers out of the Vietnam War. Uh, for, for those who don't know the, you know, the Pentagon papers were classified accounting of the Vietnam War. Um, it was a, a, a study commissioned by Robert McNamara, I believe, uh, and it was, it was leaked to, um, uh, by Daniel Ellsberg, who was at the Rand Corporation. And Daniel Ellsberg was also a former Marine. Uh, and he leaked them to Neil Sheehan of the New York Times. And then, uh, you know, eventually the papers find their way over to the Washington Post. Uh, are the Afghanistan papers the modern day version of the Pentagon papers? Because there seems to be also a lot of disagreement about that. Well, I, look, they're not the same thing. There's a lot of similarities and there's some important differences. And I'll, I'll enumerate some of that. So the Pentagon papers was a top secret you know, study of what U.S. involvement in Vietnam was. And this was commissioned by Robert McNamara himself, the Secretary of Defense. Uh, but he was so concerned that this might get out because it was so sensitive that he ordered the historians, essentially, the people at the Pentagon who were putting together this study, he ordered them not to interview anybody, that they could only base this study based on documentation, like, uh, you know, uh, 
uh, memos among commanders, uh, written orders, reports, uh, diplomatic cables, intelligence assessments, things like that. You know, it was all very hush-hush and it was all classified. And as you pointed out, a, a Marine, a former Marine, Daniel Ellsberg, leaked them uh, to the New York Times and the Washington Post and other places. Uh, but what the Pentagon Papers showed was that what uh, the US government had said over multiple administrations uh, about US involvement in Vietnam wasn't true. They withheld a lot of uh, events and they masked US involvement in certain operations. And you know, they just they they weren't telling the truth about the war. And the Afghanistan papers, there's a fundamental difference, a number of them actually. The documents that the Special Inspector General for Afghanistan had done, these were all interviews. So in contrast with the Pentagon papers where they interviewed no one, the Afghan papers are really most all interviews. These are notes and transcripts of where they would sit down with people involved in the war and they would give their verbal description of what went wrong. The special inspector general's interviews also, none of them were classified, at least not at first. It was only after the Washington Post started asking for them under the public records laws that the, the federal government tried to classify some of them. Uh, some of that they were successful in, some of them they weren't, but they were, they were essentially trying to make them secret after the fact. So those are two big differences. But what they have in common is the Afghanistan papers also contain all these revelations about what went wrong in Afghanistan and how the U.S. government across three presidential administrations weren't telling the truth about what was going on. And they were actively concealing uh, what was really happening on the battlefront. So in that respect, the Pentagon Papers and the Afghanistan Papers uh, are very similar. Um, I have a, sort of a, a final sort of question before we open it up to the audience for questions. And, 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 and like you said, it, it, you know, um, in your foreword, you, you talk about that your book does not aim to provide an, an exhaustive history record of the US war in Afghanistan. Um, it is, not a, it is not a military history that dwells on combat operations. Rather, it is an attempt to explain what went wrong and how three consecutive presidents and their administrations failed to tell the truth. And obviously your book was written, you know, before what we've seen over the last couple of weeks. And I'm wondering if, do you think the Biden administration falls into that category as well? Which category of not telling the truth? The category of, of not fully telling the truth. I, I think the Biden administration in particular, the president, uh, I don't know that they were lying. I think they were, uh, they just got things wrong. You know, Biden was asked back in July when US troops had almost entirely withdrawn from Afghanistan. He was asked, are we gonna see another Saigon moment in Afghanistan? And what that the reporter meant was uh, referring to 1975 in Vietnam when the United States was evacuating people off the roof of the U.S. Embassy uh, while the North Vietnamese were pouring into Saigon. You know, it was a very chaotic evacuation at the last moment, very dangerous. And, and Biden was dismissive of this. He says, no, 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 we're not going to have any of that. You know, this is going to be an orderly withdrawal. You know, there, he, was, he was angry almost at this comparison to Vietnam in 1975. You know, I, I think at that point, I don't think Biden knew what was coming. I think they were just caught by surprise. So I don't think in their description of what was about to happen, uh, you know, they certainly made many mistakes, but I don't think they were actively lying about stuff. Uh, certainly in recent weeks, maybe they weren't always forthcoming with information, but I don't think they were, were actively lying. Whereas uh, the three prior administrations would, would all actively lie at times. At other times they would spin, at other times they would withhold or hide the truth. But I think Biden's people, he, the president and his administration, uh, they just weren't prepared for what was coming and, and, and miscalculated. Yeah, in regards to the Saigon moment, yeah, I was struck by, you know, again, I think it was so, so many comparisons, you know, when, when Afghans started to fall, you know, from C-17s as they were lifting off from Kabul airport, you know, people were, you know, they were thinking to themselves, you know, the last time I saw that was 9-11. And uh, what's interesting is I went into the archives and I found footage from CBS News from the evacuations in 1975. And they looked exactly like the evacuations at Kabul. And in fact, when the last flight was taking off from Da Nang in, in 1975, you had seven 
Vietnamese individuals fall from their, those aircraft as well. And so, you know, the saying about, you know, history doesn't, you know, history doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes, uh, you know, I think is what we saw over the last couple of, um, couple of weeks here. Um, so yeah, if you're open, I would love to open it up to the audience uh, for questions. Um, one person asks, uh, why is there still no acknowledgement that Pakistan has been double dealing when it is in plain sight? One of our audience members asks. Yeah, so I have a, a whole chapter in the book about that. That's a running theme about Pakistan's role and in which a number of US officials in the Afghanistan papers admit that the government, particularly under President Bush, was, was slow to recognize this double game Pakistan was playing, where in public and in their meetings with Bush administration officials, uh, leaders of Pakistan would say, yes, we're on your side in the war on terror. Uh, we're helping you out. No, we're not supporting the Taliban or the insurgents. But uh, in fact, other elements of the Pakistani government, particularly uh, the intelligence services, were offering refuge to Taliban leaders and possibly even helping them with, with, uh, with equipment and other resources. So th this is a constant running theme through the book, but uh, in, you know, for a number of reasons, US government was always, uh, they would confront the Pakistanis about this, but they would only go so far. Uh, one reason the US couldn't really figure out what to do is they were dependent on the government of Pakistan to allow the US military to use its territory to transport supplies to Afghanistan. Afghanistan, of course, is a landlocked country. Uh, we couldn't come in through Iran to the east, excuse me, to the west. You know, the best route into Afghanistan for all, all our supplies was through Pakistan and the port at Karachi. Uh, so we were really, and we also had to fly through Pakistani airspace to reach Afghanistan. So, you know, we, we couldn't confront the Pakistanis too much and they knew this. So on one hand, they're, they're helping us hunt down certain Al-Qaeda figures in Pakistan, uh, but they, under the surface, they were helping the, the Taliban rejuvenate itself. And this is something that uh, the US government never really figured out how to do. And there was a lot of naivete in the early years. A lot of US officials admit that they were slow to recognize this. Uh, Sarah Katz asks, uh, can either one of you comment on the influence of the coverage of the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq of journalists being embedded with the troops? What do you think about that, Jim? Did you ever come across any embeds while you were there? I did, several of them. Um, um, Laura Logan, when she was at 60 Minutes, uh, Scott Pelley, who was also a um, frontline. Um, I mean, at the time, um, I mean, I was focused on not getting, <laughs> not dying. Uh, I do remember um, at the time I was uh, very, uh, yeah, I was pissed off and angry at Frontline, uh, but that's because there's certain things I didn't know. So Frontline had gone in with us on my first day in combat in, 20, uh, in July 2nd of 2009. Uh, there was an individual who was killed. His name was Lance Corporal Charles Seth Sharp. Um, he was shot in the neck and, and there's footage of it. Um, and it's very graphic and, and he dies on, on film. Skip to a couple months later and I'm still in Afghanistan, still going on patrols and getting shot at. And we got word that this frontline documentary had come out called Obama's War. And it showed that footage. And so it was very surreal watching um, footage of someone die from just a few months ago while we were still in, in Afghanistan. And, and where the anger came from was we didn't know if his parents knew that this footage existed. You know, uh, and, and, and the, his parents signed off on it. They wanted the world to see what, um, what the sacrifice was on the ground. But we didn't know that they had signed off on that. So we were pretty upset with Frontline, you know, but uh, that was because of what we didn't know. But um, I'm not sure, I don't, I'm, I don't know. What yeah, I think? think it's always, <laughs> as a journalist, it's always better to have more access to the troops. I mean, we want to give as accurate and vivid of a picture to the United States, to, to the American people about war is like and what's going on over there and what the troops are facing. And embeds are one way to do that. If we're only getting our information from briefings or independent interviews, we're limiting our understanding of what's going on on the front lines. Uh, the problem is that uh, during the initial years of the war, 
you could go on embed, said it was relatively open. I mean, it was right. fairly controlled, but you could ask for an embed and uh, you know, sooner or later you'd get one. During the last eight years of the war, it became increasingly difficult to get an embed under the Obama administration or Trump administrations, that there was a deliberate effort by those governments to uh, minimize news coverage from Afghanistan of what US troops were doing. So it became very difficult to get access to the troops or even interviews with commanders. Again, the purpose of this is uh, the government didn't want the American people to, to pay attention to what was going on in Afghanistan. It wanted it to recede from the headlines or from television coverage and so unfortunately that those that coverage option had largely been choked off for the last you know eight years or so. I will say when I became a journalist, there was one point uh, that became very frustrating with me. And it's actually, uh, there is a Vietnam parallel here. Um, in Vietnam, there used to be something called the, um, the five o'clock follies. And that was when journalists would gather up on um, the, uh, they would meet on uh, the top of a hotel in Saigon and they would get the daily press briefings. And it would be, you know, uh, this is the number of enemies killed today. This is the number of shorty flights today. And what journalists would do was they would take the information from the five o'clock follies, and then they would go out into the field and ask the troops what the real story was. And so that's how they could figure out if they were getting, you know, the real sort of story about Vietnam from the officials or if they were lying. Um, skip to uh, the Afghanistan war, um, journalists throughout the war would get, um, uh, at, at, you know, uh, reports about um, how many Afghan uh, Afghans were killed among the Afghan security, uh, uh, Afghan um, members of the Afghan National Security Force. We would get um, information about contested areas. We would also get information about, you know, um, airstrikes that were occurring in Afghanistan. And right around 2017, the Pentagon started classifying all that, or the Afghan government started classifying all that. So around 2016, 2017, journalists who were commonly getting these updates no longer got um, how many casualties were dying, you know, how many Afghans were dying that were members of the Afghan security force. We no longer got contested area reports, or um, another one was enemy initiated attack reports, you know, when the Taliban attacked uh, either US or coalition forces. Um, and it made it way more difficult to report on the Afghanistan war. And, and they tied everything. The, the reason that the Pentagon gave for classifying all these things was there was ongoing peace talks. You know, yeah, well, and, I mean, but you're right. The irony here is that the last several years of the war, again, there was this concerted attempt to choke off news coverage and choke off facts about right. what's going on. We didn't even get the five o'clock follies, right? We, we couldn't even get interviews, right. there, were, there, there were barely any press releases going out or any information. Uh, the, the irony is in recent years, it became a lot easier for journalists to embed with the Taliban or get regular updates from Taliban spokespeople than it was from the US military. Uh, I mean, that that's was a real sign of how the war was going. The Taliban felt much more confident in their side and the US military uh, was losing confidence. But I mean, think about that for a minute when the Taliban was becoming more press savvy than the US military. Right. Uh, we talk about, um, this is a question from the audience. We talk about corruption by the Afghan government. What about US contractors who benefited the most from the day, uh, from day one of the war? Yeah, this is a theme you see uh, again in the Afghanistan papers. There, there was so much money being spent that all sorts of people, uh, profited from it. And it was US contractors, foreign defense contractors, Afghan government officials, the Taliban, criminal syndicates, uh, you know, everybody was was pocketing money off this. And at one point during the height of the spending dur during Obama's surge, the US military uh, sent some forensic auditors in to look at US military defense contracts in the war zone. And this is everything from supplying, you know, water and food to ammunition and force protection and all sorts of stuff. And they estimated that as much as 40% of the billions of dollars in defense contracts that were being spent each year, as much as 40% ended up in the pockets of, of either the Taliban or insurgents or criminal syndicates or corrupt Afghan officials. Uh, and when these auditors went to the Afghan government with the findings, the response they got was 40%, you're, you're underestimating it. It's probably worse than that. 
So, you know, it wasn't just defense, U.S. defense contractors, all sorts of people were, were profiting off this from all sides. And again, this is one of the ironies. We ended up spending, uh, you know, billions and billions of dollars over there. And, uh, you know, only a small percentage of it was going to the purposes that were intended. That's a good question. Was, was Cigar established by Congress? And if so, was this the first time Congress had established an IG to analyze a war while it was ongoing? Uh, I can answer the first part of this. It, the Inspector General for Afghanistan was created by Congress. And the reason was that so that unlike other inspectors general, uh, they don't have to report to the, the department they're covering, right? And that the administration, the president essentially can't fire the inspector general. And the purpose of this inspector general is to investigate reports of fraud, waste, and abuse in the war zone. Uh, I don't know if this is the first time Congress appointed one or not, but that was certainly the case here. Uh, Scott asks, did Trump's deal with the Taliban in this, and I'm, um, I guess he's referring to uh, the February 29th, 2020 deal. Uh, did Trump's deal with the Taliban set the stage for what happened in August? Well, sort of, sure. I mean, he, he was trying to negotiate an, an agreement with the Taliban so that U.S. troops could withdraw and that the Taliban would engage in peace talks with the Afghan government and uh, also agreed to not let al-Qaeda back in the country and, and all sorts of other arrangements. Um, but you know, Trump, like Obama, had been trying to find a way out of the war. And Trump's uh, deal that was announced in February 2020, uh, the Americans committed to withdrawing all U.S. troops, I think it was by by May of this year. But, uh, you know, of course, by the time Trump left office, it was sort of kicked down the road and this agreement was left to the Biden administration. Uh, Biden was not obligated to follow it. It wasn't like a peace treaty that had been approved by Congress or anything. It was an agreement between Trump and the Taliban. But uh, Biden also wanted to pull out of Afghanistan like Trump. I think people uh, maybe don't recognize how Biden and Trump were actually on the same page. They were they were both searching for a way uh, to pull out while saving face and trying to hope that the Afghan government didn't collapse while that happened. So uh, did, did Trump's agreement pave the way for what happened in August? Well, in the sense that it made it easier for Biden to withdraw, yeah, it did. Is, is that to blame for why the Afghan government fell apart? Uh, I think that's arguable. Um. Philip asks, what are your thoughts on officials' motivations to not be truthful? Is it as simple as careerism within the Pentagon, the State Department, et cetera? I think careerism has a lot to do with it. Uh, you have to understand in the military in particular, you're not gonna do anything to contradict the chain of command in public. So if you're a, a, a major or a colonel, you're not gonna say something that you might get in trouble for with your boss. Uh, but it's the same thing if you're a general, if you start giving these blunt assessments, criticizing what's going on in Afghanistan, you're, getting, you're gonna get in trouble with the commander in chief, the president. So really what the generals were saying throughout the war was following the talking points and script that were, that were set by the White House. Uh, so you had to be pretty brave to, to go against the grain in that sense. I'll give you one example. The one general in the war, the one war commander who really started to tell the truth with the American people that things weren't going well, was a guy named General David McKiernan. He was an army general in charge of all US forces and NATO forces in the war zone in 2008 and 2009. So he overlapped with uh, the last part of Bush's term in the beginning of Obama's. And in 2008, 2009, things weren't going well. Uh, the Taliban was getting stronger. Uh, US troops were struggling to tamp down the insurgency. Uh, it was clear that the tide of the war had, had shifted. And McKiernan starts to acknowledge this. He said, we're not winning in Afghanistan. He says, it doesn't mean we've lost, but things aren't going in the right direction. And he was open that he needed more forces and, and more, more, more other resources to, to change the direction. Uh, well, in May of 2009, uh, McKiernan suddenly gets fired. Uh, and th at the Pentagon at the time, Defense Secretary Robert Gates uh, didn't really give a reason for why he fired McKiernan. He said, well, we just, we need some new thinking. I thought it was time for a change. And he was pressed by reporters, but why would you fire him? You know, that's an extraordinary step. And Gates really didn't, didn't have a clear reason, even though Gates had, had appointed him to begin with. And just to give you a sense how unusual this was, the last time a war commander had been relieved 
uh, you know, in the middle of a war like that was General Douglas MacArthur during the Korean War when he was fired by uh, Harry Truman. So this is a really unusual step. And yet Gates could really give no, he couldn't give any example of something McKiernan had done wrong. Uh, but in interviews we obtained for the Afghanistan papers, there were army officers who served with McKiernan who said that shortly before he was fired, he came to them and said, uh, you know, I think I did too good a job of telling uh, telling it exactly how bad things were getting over here is that he had, he had seen this moment coming and that he saw it as essentially punishment for telling the truth. Now, whether Gates uh, intended this or not, the message he sent to the force was, you know, you need to be careful about what you say in public. McKiernan was blunt that things weren't going well and look at him, he got fired. So from that point forward, there weren't any other generals who were being uh, blunt about how things were going in Afghanistan. Everybody clung to the talking points, which is that they were making progress no matter what. Uh, this question is from Susan. Um, after uh, bin Laden was killed in, in, in 2011, uh, was anyone really saying to get out of Afghanistan? Well, yes and no. So that coincided with the end of Obama's surge, the troop surge. He had already uh, timed it so that by the summer of 2011, the number of troops would start slowly pulling out of Afghanistan. And, and the point was he hoped by the end of uh, his second term that they would all come out. So the timing looked good, right? Bin Laden was killed. So that removed another reason for keeping US military forces over there. And, and Obama was trying to draw down. Uh, but that said, you know, as even Joe Biden has said, they should have moved quicker and they should have used bin Laden's death uh, as, as a reason to pull out more quickly or at least more definitively. But uh, Obama decided in the end that he was worried that if he did fulfill his promise to end the war and pull out all US troops, that the Afghan army and police weren't ready yet to defend their country, that the Afghan government might fall apart and that the Taliban uh, would eventually take over. So he ended up keeping US troops there and prolonging the war. Uh, Jennifer asks, President Biden recently said we'd continue to get people out of Kabul. Is that even possible at this point? Uh, you know, it all depends on what the Taliban allows. We don't have forces over there. So uh, we're not operating flights. We don't have an embassy that we've staffed up so that if there is a way for people to leave the country, that really depends on whether the Taliban, is, are they gonna let it happen or are people just gonna sneak out on their own, whether it's across a land border or going on some other humanitarian flight or if a third country intervenes to help. But you know, it's gonna be very tough for a while. Uh, you know, the moment when everybody could leave uh, you know, was really the past few weeks. And of course, many, many, many people were left behind. That sort of goes into the next question uh, from Tal. Uh, what will the relationship with the Taliban be going forward, if any? That's a really good question. And Biden's got a really, uh, he's got a challenge there. What's he gonna do? This, the Taliban we were fighting for 20 years, uh, all of a sudden they're in control of Afghanistan. What are we gonna do? The Taliban actually would love for the United States to offer diplomatic recognition to its new government. Uh, the Biden administration says, well, you know, they're hesitant, but they haven't ruled it out. And we'll see what happens uh, over the next several months. Uh, the Taliban's even asked the United States to keep its embassy open. Uh, we haven't done that. But, you know, the, the problem here, well, there's many problems, but one is the United States is really worried about an economic collapse in Afghanistan. The Afghan economy was largely dependent on money that we sent in and other donor countries contributed to keep the Afghan economy afloat. So there's real worry uh, that Afghanistan, which is already such a fragile economy, could, could really get bad in the coming months and years if we, if we choke off all that aid. So we're getting, already there are signs that we're able to keep funneling some humanitarian aid through other agencies or the UN or things like this. But you know, at what point, at what level are we going to deal with the Taliban uh, on, in terms of trying to help the Afghan people? Uh, the other aspect of the relationship that's even more interesting is to what degree can the United States work with the Taliban on counterterrorism operations against uh, groups like Islamic State in Afghanistan, uh, also known as ISIS. Um, the Taliban and ISIS are, are sworn enemies. The ISIS thinks the Taliban is too moderate and they've been fighting each other. 
And the United States has been trying to, has been fighting ISIS for a number of years. Uh, recently, I think it was just last week, the CIA director, William Burns, flew into Kabul and actually met with the Taliban leadership, uh, which was a remarkable exchange considering this had been our sworn enemy for so long. And now the CIA director is meeting with the top leadership. Uh, US military generals have also met uh, with the heads of the Taliban. So there, it's interesting, there's a lot of contact going on there more than you might think uh, for what was supposed to be our enemy for the last two decades. Um, this person says uh, the US presence in Afghanistan prevented a terrorist attack on the US mainland for 20 years. We gave the Afghan people the opportunity for a much better life. Uh, I don't see this war as a total failure. I see it as a partial success, partial failure. Is that reasonable in your view? You know, that, that is a tough question. That's one that a lot of people are grappling with in, who are responsible for the war. Uh, it is clear that within the first six months of the war that the original threat from Al Qaeda was largely extinguished in Afghanistan. Uh, you know, Al Qaeda at that point, again, they, they were, most of its leaders were captured, killed, or had fled. And, you know, at that point, Al Qaeda, what was left of it, really moved on. They reconstituted themselves as best they could in other countries like Pakistan, uh, also Yemen, Somalia, Iraq, Syria. Uh, they also sent cells to Europe. Uh, so Al Qaeda has been uh, diminished over the years, but you know they don't need Afghanistan as a base anymore. So in that narrow sense, the war was successful in, in diminishing that threat from Al Qaeda from Afghanistan. And ultimately, you know, bin Laden himself was killed. Uh, but the question is, what have we really accomplished in the last 10 years since bin Laden's death in Afghanistan? And, you know, at that point, really, our goals were to try and prop up the Afghan army and prop up the Afghan government. And, you know, we failed at both of those because they're both gone. So we're coming up on an hour. So um, I'll, I'll let this be the last question. Um, it says, what are your thoughts on how we can prevent these types of mistakes in the future from the lies to the no clear goals of winning? Well, we thought maybe we'd learned our lessons from Vietnam uh, when we had a lot of these same questions we were grappling with. And, you know, for a while we did. The United States was very reluctant to get involved in a conflict overseas in a country that it didn't have a history with, uh, where maybe, you know, the threats were a little diffuse. And, uh, you know, but that changed after September 11th. So a generation later, we, we thought we, we had learned our lessons, but we hadn't. It, it's sort of instructive to look back at some of what President Bush said in 2001 at one of his first press conferences after the war began in Afghanistan, he was asked, are we going to get pulled into another Vietnam here? Could this be a quagmire? And Bush, you know, said no. He dismissed the idea. He said, we learned our lessons from Vietnam. We're not going to get stuck like that again. Uh, well, you know, obviously we didn't learn that lesson and, and you hope we, we would learn some lessons this time. But, you know, as the years go on, uh, you know, we tend to see things differently and, and we forget uh, what, what, what we should have learned from the past. Well, thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure um, to interview you today. Jim, thank you. I really appreciate it. I, before we go back to Brad, I just want to thank Politics and Prose especially for hosting this. Uh, Politics and Prose has been my neighborhood bookstore for 20 uh, some years and it's a special place and uh, particularly for events such as this. So, so thanks, Brad, and, and to your store. Appreciate that and uh, great moderating, Jim and, and Craig. Yeah, you know, I keep w wondering what, what would have happened to all those revelatory uh, interviews that formed the basis of your book had you, had you not gotten hold of them and shaped them into such a powerful, illuminating and uh, instructive narrative. Um, there's, there's so much truth finally and uh, about the war in, in your book. And, and as you say, let's hope that at this time, you know, the right lessons are, are, are learned. To everyone watching, thanks for tuning in. A reminder that uh, in the chat column, uh, you can find a link for purchasing copies of the Afghanistan papers. From all of us here at Politics and Prose, stay well and well read. <laughs>